Hi, my name is Ron Dennell, and most of you associate me with your insurance program with the NWT Association of Communities. That is still the case, and today I would like to introduce you to a loss prevention subject that could save your community governments millions of dollars in future building repair costs. Community governments are exposed to all sorts of risks, and one of those risks which has received little attention is the melting of permafrost and the effects that it can have on your buildings. This short film presentation by Ed Hove of EBA Engineering in Yellowknife will walk you through the basic information on permafrost in the NWT. Across the north, many buildings are built on permafrost. But before we get into what that means for buildings and maintenance, I thought I should tell you a little bit about what permafrost is. The technical definition of permafrost is ground that remains frozen for two or more years, but that definition doesn't really consider whether the ground is rock or soil or ice. What we are concerned about in terms of buildings and permafrost is the ice in the soil. The photo you see there is a very icy site in Polituck, and they're installing piles for a building there. Now, it's pretty obvious when you look at that picture that that building is going to need that permafrost to stay frozen for to be stable. But not all frozen soil is permafrost. The figure you see here shows a lot of information with respect to ground temperatures, but what I want to draw your attention to is the blue band near the top. That represents that upper zone that freezes and thaws every year. We refer to that as the active layer. Depending on where you are in the north and what type of soil there is, that zone could be anywhere from uh, one meter to uh, three meters thick. And it's probably fair to say that that zone and that seasonal freezing and thawing causes as many problems with respect to building performance as the permafrost does. And this problem, the seasonal frost heave, is a problem right across Canada. It occurs in the north under, over permafrost, but also in the south, just the seasonal freezing and thawing. So some of what I'll be talking about is geared towards dealing with some of the seasonal frost issues as well, not just the permafrost. So where do we find permafrost? Well, it is found throughout the Northwest Territories, but it's not present everywhere. This map has it characterized in three different ways. The upper zone that you see is purple, and that is present in the northern part of the Northwest Territories and throughout all of Nunavut. That represents continuous permafrost, which means that permafrost is present pretty much everywhere. The boundary for continuous permafrost roughly follows the tree line. So if you're north of the tree line, you generally are in continuous permafrost and you're likely to have permafrost at any given site. Below that, you see a blue band. That band represents what we call either extensive or widespread discontinuous permafrost. And that means that permafrost is present anywhere between 50 and 90% of the uh, ground surface. The southern part of the Northwest Territories, you see a green band or a green area there. That's what we call sporadic discontinuous permafrost, and it means that permafrost is present in less than half the terrain. This is another way of showing permafrost distribution. To the left is north, and to the right is south. So to the north, we have the continuous permafrost that I referred to earlier. And then as you move south, you get into some gaps in the permafrost. And as we go further south, the permafrost, you see it in patches here and there. So another thing you note about the permafrost is not just how continuous it is, but the depth of the permafrost. And as you go north, the permafrost gets deeper. The last thing I'd like to show you here is the uh, active layer that we referred to previously. It's shown along the top. And what happens with the active layer is it's thicker in the south, and as you go to the north, it gets thinner. The map you see here is a summary of our findings in one page. You see a series of dots representing every community in Northwest Territories, and the colors. The red dots represent the communities that we found to be most sensitive to the impacts of climate change, and the green dots represent the communities that are considered to be least sensitive to the impacts of climate change. It's quite clear that the Beaufort Delta area is the most sensitive area in the Northwest Territories. That's because the permafrost is warm, 
So there's not a lot of room for the ground to warm up before you start seeing the impacts on the permafrost. To the northeast, the ground isn't as sensitive because the permafrost is colder, and so it has some room to accept some climate change before we become concerned about building foundations. And then gradually, as you go from north to south, the uh, permafrost becomes less sensitive for either of two reasons. As we already mentioned, there is less permafrost in the southern Northwest Territories, but the other part of it is that where there is permafrost, it's so warm that it's unlikely that the permafrost would have been relied on to uh, support a building. We have a building on a space frame foundation. You can think of it as a mechano set for grown-ups. You can see the network of pipes and they're all in triangles. That's a very rigid form of structure. The idea with this foundation type is the building sits on the ground and can move with the ground. But with the space frame, the building foundation stays rigid so that the building moves as a unit and that allows the windows and the doors not to be stressed. The building still performs normally. This is a good foundation choice for poor sites. If you have soft soils, or frost heave, or if you're concerned that the permafrost is going to thaw. Piles are another popular or common type of foundation in the north. If you have bedrock available, you try and get those piles into the bedrock, and then it doesn't matter so much if there's permafrost or not. The building will be stable in either case. The other way of doing piles is freezing them into the permafrost. We call those ad-freeze steel pipe piles. They do depend on the permafrost staying frozen. And so that's something to keep an eye on. If you have ad freeze piles, you want to make sure you do everything you can to protect the permafrost. Behind me is a good example of a house on screw jacks. It's a very common foundation type for buildings in the north. They move with the ground and they're supported on the ground. This is another very common foundation type in the north. And it's a good solution in many cases. It's simple and it's easy to maintain, but that's the key. You do have to maintain it. Periodically, the building should be re-leveled, especially if there's a lot of frost heave every year because it'll never come back quite the same. So um, if you can accept the maintenance, this is a good solution for you. Behind me, you see a building with a concrete slab on grade foundation. This foundation type would be used when you have heavy floor loads, like a fire hall or a garage, where that floor needs to be supported by the ground. But with the floor on the ground, the heat from the building can get into the ground. There's no airspace for ventilation. So if this building's on permafrost, you need to get a way to protect that permafrost from the heat. Thermal siphons would be one way to do that. Thermal siphons have two parts. One part is in the ground, and that takes that heat sucks it out of the ground and brings it out to the radiators that you see behind me. The radiators dissipate that heat to the air in the winter time, allowing the ground to stay frozen through the summer. In terms of uh, risk factors, the snow banks behind me are one type of risk factor that maintainers should try and avoid. In this case, it looks like the snow was placed by a snow removal crew, by a loader or something, but it could also form by drifting. In either case, you try and avoid that. You try and uh, either remove the snow or not allow it to build up. There's two problems with the snow. One is that the snow blocks the airflow under a building and you want to try and keep uh, access to ventilation under the building. And the second problem is that the snow acts as an insulator and doesn't allow the ground to cool off as much as it should in the wintertime. You see ice up against and actually going right underneath the building. When this thaws, this will become water and water is the enemy of permafrost. Ideally, when you build the building, you want to have it high enough that this doesn't occur. But if you see this with an existing building, you want to try and think about ways to get this water away from the building. You don't want to leave the situation the way it is. We like to have the airspace under buildings for ventilation. But the airspace should be protected, and a good way to do that is to put mesh around the outside so that it prevents 
things from getting stored on, in the airspace and from the airspace getting cluttered. You don't want to use plywood because that obstructs the airflow and doesn't allow the building to stay cool in the winter time. The one thing you want to pay attention to with skirting is you don't want the bottom of the skirting to get too close to the ground because when the ground frost heaves in the winter time it will push up against the skirting which in turn will push up the building. Cracks above doors or windows or binding doors or windows are both very common indicators that there's movement in the building. When you have this movement, it could either be as a result of permafrost thaw, where part of the building is settling, or it could be as a result of frost heave. In either case, what it's showing you is what we call differential movement, and that's what causes the cracks. To help understand what's causing the cracks, it's good to try and keep an eye on the cracks and see if they're opening or closing and at what times of the year they're doing that. Really what you're trying to understand is what parts of the building are going up and what are going down. And this helps to understand the problem. This film was made possible through funding provided to the NWTAC by Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada.